which will be starting in just a couple of seconds, we'll get to see where those adaptations actually kind of come in. UBC made the adaptation of banning away the Syndra, taking away a very a, a champion key one from Demis' seemingly very limited champion pool. And boom, they do take the Orion away is. from KT Smurf, but that means the Maokai is still open. They also have way less jungle bans, only Elise and Hecarim being targeted here. Is this going very, very quick? I think UBC is quite happy with this, knowing that Orianna has been taken away and they can still keep the Maokai unless SFU chooses to deny it. But I highly doubt it. Cassiopeia and Zac being locked in. Looks like these guys came out with a plan. Well, we'll have to see now what oh. champions actually fall back on. Is the Cassiopeia actually locked in extremely Holy. quick? And the Zac, Aurelian, Soul, and Jana What's also going picked on? up. It's rapid fire. It's speed dating League of Legends here <laughs> where every comp is against each other. Jarvan being locked away. And Maokai, of course, a pick of choice for CJ. Although I am a little bit confused by the draft from UBC. So Aurelian Soul, you want to have this guy push in your lanes and really help out the side lanes. And you want to help them out. Yeah, you have a lot of kill pressure, a lot of dive pressure, but you have Caitlyn Janet, right? You, ha you have Maokai. There's not a whole lot of opportunities for these picks to really kill somebody. So I, I'm, I really want to see what KT, Smurf, and Karza do here in the sense of going together, which lane do you prioritize, and what windows of opportunity are they looking for, be it crashing a wave and denying, or just pretending to, for there to be pressure so that your lanes mm -hmm. win. Well, that was something that UBC's done very well so far, is having the lane pressure and making sure they come out ahead in that, but they haven't necessarily been able to go, all right, we're getting kills, we're snowballing into the early tower at seven minutes. They got the first tower last game, but they took it slow and did it about 12 to 13 minute window. So it was a little bit slower, but I'm more interested in the damage threats. They have Caitlyn, they have Aurelian Soul, and that's it. Yeah, you really need that Caitlyn to hit that late game. I feel like they're really banking on it by picking that Janna as well. But I'm a little bit confused by their decision to take Soul, just because we have seen KT Smurf kind of be very good in mid lane. He's been bullying around his counterpart. He has been getting CS leads consistently. Why not put him in something that continuously lanes so that he can continuously gain those laning advantages, as opposed to an Aurelian Soul who looks elsewhere mm -hmm. for advantages? And that's just a similar idea from what we've been discussing out this entire match. You kind of want to stay to what has been working for you so far, especially when it comes to a series. Well, we'll see if it's going to be UBC or SFU that come away with the Game 5 victory. We're loading in right now, and we'll see. Is that Aurelian Soul pickup going to be the influence on the map that UBC is looking for, or is it going to be something that just, le like you mentioned, you me he leaves lane, he finds opportunities elsewhere. Is that going to give Demnis a safe landing phase to get to a point of Cassiopeia that he wasn't at versus Oriana? Are the stars nothing more than the poor airplane crossing the smoggy air of Los Angeles as opposed to a majestic <laughs> constellation of Aurelian? So most likely in Los Angeles, it's always a dirty plane. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll trust lot. your judgment. You there's just came whole, back. So. There's not a whole lot of stars here. Are you kidding me? We are near <laughs> Hollywood. There is nothing but stars. <laughs> Different That stars. kind, yes. And, well, we'll see what Aurelian Soul tries to do. We know that this guy can roam at level one down to the bottom side. He can roam top if he chooses to do so. Olaf will be starting at blue buff. As expected, he is a mana-reliant jungler. The lower he gets, the more attack speed he gets due to his passive. So if he stays low enough, he will increase his clearing speed. And the clear speed is something that Kaza has been a little bit tested on recently because we've seen him going for, on the red side, uh, or sorry, when he was on blue side, going for that early level three gank on Rek'Sai by taking the red buff and going to Krugs. Yes. He tried it on red side as Rek'Sai last game, but he did not get to that top lane until the opponent in Tough Play Love also got there going buff, wolves, buff. So it took basically just as long to do two camps as it did for three camps, and he already started outside of the map. We'll see where his pathing actually goes, because as soon as he does that start, Top Play Love has been in his face every single game. And it's a matter of cat and mouse with these jumpers. The second one shows and makes a move on one side of the map, you commit to saying, all right, I'm going to be on this quadrant for a little bit. The other side has to respond accordingly. And Top Play Love has just been better at responding to those moves, although any time that he has been put behind, mm -hmm. whereas it's on the Graves, where it's on the Zac, he really just hasn't been that impressive. Although I think that this time around, when they're going back to that diving combo of him and Golja together, we might see a little bit more success. And even though the picks and ban phase went by in 
blink of an eye, we did see that 734 has picked up Janna, so he has the ability to provide that massive disengage. So the other thing why Janna is so strong here is not just in the laning, it's in complete denying mm -hmm. what Talkplay Love can do as well as Gold Jet. The Tornado can always stop Zach ult, the Zach jump. You see Zach jump in, you put a Tornado and it's cancelled right away. He will never hit that slingshot. Same with your ultimate. Same with the shield. These low damage tanks have a very difficult time breaking through shields because they don't have a lot of damage. And so the Janna pick is just a bit of a safe buffer outside of the lane phase for UBC. And I really want to see what their idea is for transitioning this to an offensive role as opposed to a purely defensive Janna. And one thing that usually pairs with the Janna well in these kind of anti-engage compositions has been that top lane poppy. So as much as it pains me to say that Poppy would have been a really good pick here, uh, we've just seen, like you said, CJ's kind of been quote-unquote relegated to Maokai duty. He's done it extremely well the games he's played it, but he hasn't necessarily had the same confidence in any of these matches as he had with the Maokai. And another pairing that you were mentioning is actually the Aurelian Soul and Caitlyn. Because mm -hmm. Aurelian Soul, he builds that Rylize, he builds that bit of an AoE slow around whatever is near him, makes it a lot easier for these carries to exist next to their carries and essentially have a passive peel for them by their mid laner, which is just so rare to see. And we will see, however, in the top side, Kaza just figuring out that top play love did start on the bottom side, and he assumes that Zach is either bottom of his own side or invading the blue side, and both junglers just choose to mirror each other into the blue sides of the map. Well, both of the junglers going in their pass. We had a, a decent amount of, uh, not necessarily aggression, like a decent amount of passivity compared to the lane Man, phase that previous. that is all about to end with a <laughs> nice little slingshot gank. This might just only get flashed. Gets the flash, but the Deadly Flourish does come out. Now UBC 734 and 735 have to burn all of their summoner spells to get away from just one Zach E. Two flashes being blown away by a gank that should have been seen coming. The information was there from UBC. They saw that Zach was already started in the top side, that finished bottom, and so it's UBC's bottom lane's responsibility to back off and not die or blow anything from that. They're walking away with their lives, but now we have KT Smurf with no mana in a dangerous Ooh. position against Cassiopeia. He still has both of his summoner spells, oh. but he is just going to be able to hover his way out, but now we see a counter gank coming in from Kaz on this bottom lane, straight onto the Karma. Does oh. have to burn the flash, the, sh the heal goes out as well. And He's gonna walk away. The axe gets thrown short, but it doesn't matter in the end. CJ being aggressed on here by Gold Jet. I Ooh, don't think that really he has far up. No enough man. damage. The combo will be there in two seconds. Is he gonna follow that? Don't he wants so. to, but he's not. <laughs> yeah, that was a very aggressive push up there by CJ. No mana available left in his pool, but continued to press up. Knew his limits right there. Knew that Dragon was gonna be able to fully combo him down, but that is gonna potentially force a teleport out from him as he is going to wind up missing a decent sized wave if he does not. And we have to wonder what kind of player CJ is. And I think that what we have come to the conclusion is that besides top lane, uh, he's a confidence player here mm -hmm. because now we see him bullying this matchup what he once kind of struggled with. I think that now he's actually coming to terms with how he has to play this out. Ooh. And although Kaza is really just giving it the top play. Speaking of confidence, Kaza going in aggressively on the top play love, oh, who was no. aggressively taking these, his own raids there. The Help teleport coming in from Jarvan is going to do that cute little trick to keep the Zac alive, but he will come back up as a very oh. low health bar. Now Kaza taking a lot of damage in here. The Aurelian Soul Kill aggro off. coming in here with the stars, just trying to juggle it out. The black <laughs> light no. over the wall, the black back for KT Smurf. Oh Everybody swapped the positions, and Demnis will pick up a kill. That gets into level six, the petrifying gaze comes out on the CJ. Can CJ wind up trading oh. one for one? The Arcade Smash no. misses! The sapling comes out, will it be enough? <laughs> no, it goes to the minions! CJ now stuck between a rock and a hard place, and many members of the SFU team. He's gonna go down, it's a two for none. Oh my god, that was insane. Everything that happened was just so fun to watch. We see Zach immediately trying to trying to take away the Raptors. A little cheeky move. Olaf collapses, and Aurelian Soul moves in, and then Cassiopeia comes in. Maokai comes in. The TPs from Jarvan come in. Everybody's involved into this fight, and it ends in the 2-0 for SFU on to the Cassiopeia from Demis. Now, how important is that going to be? We have seen him struggle with making use of the gold that he's getting. He mm -hmm. has struggling in the laning phase as well. So this is just gonna allow him to be a little bit more even in gold with KT Smurf, but we really don't know how much he can carry.
Yeah, and that's going to be a big question mark here. The Syndra he was fine with, but the Cassiopeia, when he was needed to land those clutch petrifying gazes, he wasn't really on point. He's not necessarily as comfortable being as close range as Cassiopeia has to be to put out a lot of that damage. And being close range against an Aurelian Soul, against a Caitlyn composition, against somebody with a Janna means that you are going to be knocked up, you're going to be zoned away, and you may not be able to get in there without taking a large brunt of damage for yourself. But now he has that confidence. The 2-0, you said, talking about confidence play from CJ, big ones from Demnis as well. When he had that Syndra and he was confident, he was doing big oh. things. But oh, there's the confidence coming from KT Smurf as he and Kha'Zix just come down to this bot lane, pick up one kill on JJL, and now Nematic not long for this world. We'll pick up a trade kill though, as the Deadly Floors rooted KT Smurf in place, and he had tower at At him. least they got that one kill in return, but now with the low health Olaf, they are gonna be able to take down this turret in one push because of the speed that these three guys can push. And all that SFU is left to take in response is Cassiopeia just pushing down and the Janna Shield providing all the extra damage as well, but it looks like Top Lane Love getting aggressive oh, once they got win. Kill. Yeah, the Tower Echo is oh, drawn out with the Monsoon clutch. from Janna, just enough to keep Kaza alive. And he defends that Tier 1, making sure that UBC doesn't do the same thing they've been doing all game long, pushing down that Tier 1 as a 1-3-1. One, one. Maokai can really hold his own against the Jarvan here, although it seems that, oh my goodness, no. Has he not leveled the ultimate on Maokai? I think he's misclicked. He has not, and he's level seven currently, so oh, he has not no. picked it up at level six or level seven. What are you doing? Well, it's a confidence play. He does. He he's knows that he's not going to be grouping up yet. Here. Well, either way, CJ is going to have potentially a little bit more front-loaded damage than Jarvan would expect if he's picked up extra levels of Arcane Smash. Maybe he's picked up an extra level of Twisted Advance, which does deal percentage of HP damage. And this has been a tanky Jarvan build that we've seen. Uh, Gold Jet going for in the previous game. Worked out extremely well for SFU in game number two, but he doesn't necessarily have a lot of front-loaded damage, especially early in the game. His only damage on it was a Titanic Hydra. And while he might not have the damage, he still has the ability to pick off the immobile members from UBC. You have nobody that can really close the gap out of terrain. It's unlike Caitlyn. Only Caitlyn can really escape with the 90 caliber net. Everybody mm. else is going to be stuck. So once we get to a phase of the game where people are roaming around, where Jarvan is looking to pick people off, if he's liberal with his use of ultimate, this should be a team that can get picks left, right, and center. The Jarvan Zack death cage was what was game number two. The ending. The oh, cage the, of goo. Yeah, the be all end all was the the cage of goo combo from God, uh, that Zach and Jarvan. Disgusting. Yeah, I, I don't think I want to be trapped in that either. I'd use my own net to get out of that one as well. But as you mentioned, not a lot of the members of UBC are going to be able to escape that death trap if they so are able to set it up. So they are going to have to really rely on this Jana to stop that engage, uh, just basically on her own, using the monsoon, using the tornado to knock them up and make sure that they can't get into that back line. And we finally see the ultimate from Maokai being leveled up. So now, just a massive level 8 power spike, although immediately Jar Zach will try to engage him. Oh. This could be a kill, although he does have flash. I the, think that he might be fine. The liberal use of the Cage of Goo right there, as Maokai is going to be able to just walk away. Ventral Maelstrom leveled up just in the nick of time to prevent a decent amount of that incoming damage. But the damage will be negated by a heal coming out from the Matic. Has to flash away, and JJL will block the ace in the hole. The Monsoon comes out there, shoves him against the wall. The Tornado to follow after that. The exhaust is down onto Kaza. He wants to go for this dive. They're just a couple oh. of minions away from getting it. 735 is low. Kaza has Push a red buff. And in comes KT Smurf. Axes or undertoes are not going to land, but now the minions have arrived and the game plan is on. Flash oh, away actually from JJL. Is he going to be able to get away? The voice of light comes out there from KT Smurf walking into oh. range. They are going to wind up picking up a kill and the tower. Such a nice attempt from Karma there to really escape that gank, but more importantly, just stalled out the entirety of the match. And that allows SFU to respond in kind, and they are gonna take down the tier one middle. So not all is lost for them. They respond very well, and they're gonna be able to keep this game within the 300 gold lead. And now UBC, they're going with the patented move. They take down the tier one middle, and they're forcing a little bit more than they can chew. They will have to retreat as SFU will commit to teleport to secure this dragon. Jarvan teleport comes in, and the Infernal Dragon looks like it's all but gonna be going over to the side of SFU. You. So they are going to secure the first dragon of the game for themselves about 12 minutes, and that's another Infernal one as their first dragon. And that one will be even better when you have a Jin as somebody that stacks up a lot of flat AD. This means that that late game from you to SFU will be significantly stronger than it was before. So keeping an eye on what kind of dragon matters is 
or is, is spawning is incredibly important for SFU. And we'll have to see what that Jin is going to wind up building. We saw 735 going for an interesting Infinity Edge first build, though the components on the side of Nomadic seem like he's going a little bit more traditional later game build with the Essence Reaver rush early. Morella has already been picked up by Cassiopeia as well as the tier stacking away. We have double Ruby Crystals on Zac, in addition to some Ionian Boots of Lucidity completed early to try to get as many slingshots in. And what the Morellos or the Essence Reaver really offers is that increased cooldown which allows you to go towards middle to really threaten multiple other people in the map. It's for you that you as Jin can really be that utility AD carry that just creates picks left, right, and center. I think that's what he's going for right now. And it's going to be really exciting to see if he chooses to go towards middle and really put the emphasis onto the Aurelian soul. Because if you keep the soul restricted, you essentially keep a lot of the plays that UBC has on the map completely in check. And we have seen the curtain call being used as a form of Pseudo engagement when you have the Jarvan Cataclysm and the Zach Elastic Slingshot to kind of capitalize on that as soon as you tag one of those targets with a slowing bolt, could potentially be lights out with that. We'll have to see though, are they going to be able to utilize this one at all? As it looks like UBC are the ones that are making moves on the map first up. They have taken that bottom lane tower, and just like the previous games have said, as soon as that bottom lane tower goes down, the bottom lanes have lane swapped. And the lanes are going to the top side and getting all the vision to connect mid and top together. We can ignore the bottom quadrant now. As Oop. Jarvan gets jumped in, he still does have combo Ooh. down for about a couple of three seconds. He will go down. He just walks into a whole team. Oh, but Ace in the hole winds up coming out. Caitlyn being able to do that. Really good synergy there between the Twisted Advance, Arcane Smash, and the and the Yordle Snap Trap. Just keeping that Jarvan from moving just whatsoever. Just really punishing oh. where somebody's out of position here. They can, they can utilize this effectively. A nice little engage, a three-man karma cube. But Jin is going to wind them up. Cassiopeia is having a field day on the right. Ooh, the pilot and gaze comes out as well. Top play love looked like he was walking into his death, but turned that one around thanks to some courage of the Colossus oh. shields coming out. The blast blank gets everybody out from UBC as well. The Aurelian Soul stun does connect, and that's going to be a disengage from How that. is that blast zone doing so much work this series? Everybody's using that to really elevate the excitement of this game to a whole nother platform. This is really, that was a great collapse from everybody. Immediately picking off the driver and the SFU forgets that they're one man down when that entire engage begins. Cassiopeia, while she did have a good position on the side, was unable to connect the petrifying gate. Nobody got stunned. And so they immediately turned on her and she was forced to flash over the wall. But she had gotten so low that everybody just followed through and finished her off. And that was the problem we mentioned before. Demnis not being able to land crucial ultimates like that paralyzing engaged. If he had stunned one member, just one member, would have been an additional kill and potentially more follow-up coming in from the side of SSFU. But that was another 4v5 kind of situation. They were manned down when that fight actually began, and still top play love on the Zac was able to turn it around. The shields coming out onto him, the courage of the Colossus, and just his own self-heal have been massive at turning fights around where UBC hasn't really expected it. Uh, they actually don't expect this gang onto Aurelian until either the stun does wind up coming up. Not enough damage to do with Jarvan and, and that's Cassius. how strong Jarvan is. He gets onto your carries, he gets into the guys that don't have flat, and immediately traps them in. If there is any sort of follow-up, they will certainly go down but luckily UBC answered at the same time and they're able to trade away that kill on to the mid lane for a tier one top lane and now that mid turret tier one is down this is a perfectly fine trade for them they're able to snowball that gold lead as the turret will matter more than a two and two around the soul they have the two side lanes now down in favor of UBC the mid lane is the one in favor of SFU which gives UBC a fairly easy target as to where they're going to go next Normally, when you're especially running a Caitlyn composition, you want to push down all those outer towers, not as quickly as possible, but Caitlyn is very good at pushing down those outer towers. So mid lane will be the focus from UBC most likely. Whereas now with SFU, they have their driver in online. He's one, one, and two. He's built up some of his core tank and he has a spear. Uh, he has a special cal just to go head to head against any of the magic damage he's going to encounter from the Maokai or the Aurelian Soul. And he also has the uh, Bam the Bami Cinder, so he's going to be able to just keep that split push going on, which is something that Gold just been able to do pretty much on any champion this year. And what that allows him to do, if he can split push, is it allows him to make the same moves that he made onto Aurelian Soul, where you push up the lane and you collapse onto a side, you collapse onto a. a adjacent lane and that lets you put more pressure on the map and essentially you can win somebody else's lane by winning your own by roaming and saying hey i'm also coming to your lane mm -hmm. whoever you're against can't push the lane as quickly as i can and so you push back ubc's approaches onto the minion wave and it gives a little bit more map room for you to work with and work with more space which allows you to do more things 
We saw the Ace in the Hall just being used for a little bit of cheeky poke damage onto Demnis' Cassiopeia in the mid lane. Demnis himself has picked up an additional needlessly large rod, whereas the Hextech GLP had been finished by KT Swerve a little while ago, in addition to a Dark Seal, which sadly has zero stacks currently. <laughs> that Dark Seal is definitely containing absolutely nothing of importance <laughs> because there is only the ability to influence the flash that he currently has, although now they're grouping into a five-man push, which is what we wanted to see out of this composition before. Caitlyn, Aurelian, so lots of peel, lots of protect, and immediately engage with the disengage coming in from the Tornado. And the teleport coming in from the side of Goljet. We'll see how the Aurelian, Soul and Caitlyn do it, keeping themselves alive. The sun comes out and forces the flash out of Goljet, the curtain call comes out there. Demnis trying to go for a flank, uses the paralyzed engage, but it's on the Ragnarok. Olaf Kaza is not going to get stuff for that. A flash forward from CJ as UBC is turning the heat on, goes in forward. The twisted advance did land, nobody's died yet. The Cataclysm was still available, and he's gotten into the back line on the carries. But the John is keeping Caitlyn alive. The net came out, and Caitlyn goes on a killing spree. KT Smurf in the meantime goes forward, oh. gets the Jana shield, gets the Jana heal. Stays alive and it's a two for nothing. That Janet just saved Aurelian soul skin so many times and everybody just walking away and damn is just out of sync with his team. What we first saw as an idea to flank into the top side is really nothing more than just a mid laner struggling to be in coordination with his team. We saw him again try to solo engage onto the right hand side of the fight, immediately gets targeted out by the Olaf, gets zoned away, the petrifying gaze just does not Nothing. And so he has to retreat until we see Cassiopeia be joined with the tanks, be in a position that he is peeled for and cared for. These fights will go nothing more but UBC's way. And UBC utilizing the power of their composition extremely well. Aurelian still staying near Caitlyn as long as Jarvan was in the back line. As soon as Jarvan flashed out, Aurelian Soul knew that that was his motion to go forward and to be a dive buddy with the Olaf, with the Maokai. He knew that he can go into the front lines. And even though Jarvan saved that Cataclysm and stayed alive extremely long, without the threat of being able to go in and then go back out and only being able to go in. The John appealed, the Caitlyn netted out, and he took him down. And that's not even with the Rylize out of Aurelian Soul. Once the Rylize gets completed, the decisions that the tanks will have to make between going in and out and entering Aurelian, Zo Aurelian Soul's zone will be a lot tougher because you just cannot leave that at that point. He can literally engage onto you by using the ultimate, which has a longer range than his orbs, then catching up to you with the orbs, and then utilizing his stun. So the ways that he has to keep you grounded and keep you in the range of getting CC'd by everybody else are just massive. And so now the tanks that already struggled enough to get in when you have to deal with Janna, with Malka, and with Soul will now have an even tougher job when the Rylas is complete. He's already got the needlessly large rod in his pocket. He's also picked up three more stacks on that dark that dark seal, which is three more than he previously had in that fight. However, like you mentioned, the Rylai's Crystal Scepter is going to be a huge power spike for Aurelian Soul. We see already Olaf going for what looks like is going to be something along the lines of a brand new Zomich. When he gets on that back line, they are not going to be able to get away from him. And pieces of the Sunfire Cave finished now for the side of CJ's Maokai. Has the Spectral Cowl of his own. We'll see what he winds up building up in addition to that. But on the flip side, for the side of SFU, we still haven't necessarily had a lot of big ticket items coming to play. Cassiopeia building her own Rylize, oh. but they're going to try to get some gold to fund that with this fight coming in. Talk play Love goes in onto CJ, but the Ventral Maelstrom comes out, keeping him and Kaza still above half HP. The Curtain Call has already been used, so that is the signal to disengage, exit stage backwards towards that mid lane tower. But on the side of the fight here, Aurelian Soul here from KT Smurf was trying to come into the side, but a quick duck away from the side of SFU keeps everybody alive. He was roaming from the bottom side, but UB SFU trying to engage onto the tanks, and that's just not where you want to be. You don't have enough damage to really burn through Janna's heals and shields and the tank's innate survivability. And this engage right here, trying to utilize the turret to keep Olaf in, the, in check, is going to result in just Golgi getting killed. Yeah, Goljet winds up going down here. The Hexic GLP was slowing out just long enough. The Paral uh, oh, Paralysis no. Gaze came out and only wound up resulting in slows here. The Janna Monsoon is still available. That's the disengage cube for the side of UBC now. Demnus trying to go forward. Twin Fangs are sinking into CJ, but he's going to stay alive. 735 does get flash forward on after being rooted up there by the Jin. Cassiopeia winds up getting that shut down onto Caitlyn. They cannot chase as Janna's Tornado will certainly stop Zax from engaging. But a lot of creativity there from SFU, really trying to force something, making sure that Olaf stays trapped in their turret so that they can get a kill, letting everybody know that a collapse is happening, and so a five-man player play results 
and that's what you want to see out of a team that is in the back. They recognize that we have to be grouped up. The only way we can win a fight with this gold deficit is gonna be with an item advantage or with a person advantage. So they keep going for that. A TP is gonna go through, or it gets canceled right at the end from Malkai. Yeah, so CJ utilizing the teleport. So that will be on cooldown, which means that now Goldjet knows he has that for his own advantage in the top side of the map. It won't be available for a couple of minutes there. Who knew the uh, old 2013 uh, Olaf cage? Still was a, a pretty solid idea to bring out here. Olaf without the flash does mean he cannot escape from that. And when it's right under tower, it's taking a lot of damage. And that used to be a way for Olaf to play into Jarvan. You just take flash. But it just limits the ways that he has to really engage. If he had the likes of a Karma on his side instead of a Janna, I think I'd be content with him going with a... a flash approach here into the Jarvan, but he hasn't really suffered too much in the uh -oh. engagement to come out here on the left side. 735 might be caught out right here. Flash over the wall from Goljet. Aggressive. Oh. He goes back in with the Cataclysm over the wall. Too. Yeah, he traps the Olaf here. The Cassiopeia wants to pick up the first kill. Deadly Flourish goes out and it's a double kill as the Poison and the Deathfire touch tick away. Cassiopeia picks up two for herself. And this is the cue to go to Baron. The AD carry is down and the jungler. There is no threat of a smite. All they need to do is start the Baron, have somebody tank it, and this should be a free objective for the likes of SFU. There, or, there is not enough damage on UBC to really contest this. Right now, like you mentioned, no real big damage. It's Aurelian Soul, the biggest of them all right now from the side of UBC, but CJ is a big tanky threat as he's just dissuading them from doing Baron. Baron damage coming out is pretty strong itself. Jana Monsoon knocks them back into the pit here. JJL has to be very careful. Baron's gonna start regenning as well. Flash over the wall there for Nomadic is gonna seal the deal onto 734, but have they bought enough time for the carries to come up? Caitlyn is now back alive. Olaf, Olaf is, is alive too. as well, and the Baron had regen to full HP. Don't think that's enough time. Aurelian Soul is still alive and healthy. He's got plenty of mana to assist this fight. Well, he's zoning at the AD carry too. Nomadic is extremely the ace level oh, comes no. out and finds the spot. JJL goes down. Maokai's going to pick up a kill on Cassiopeia. That's a shutdown onto the damage. And Aurelian Soul takes a bit of a journey over the wall. And, and now it's UBC oh. sitting sights on Baron. Oh, God. The Baron throws are too real. And immediately UBC decides that their carries have lived long enough and they can take this Baron now. There is no answer from SFU here. They're going to try to steal. Oh, oh, the splash and the smite is not enough. Goldjet teleports in over the wall as well. Is this Cataclysm available? It is but he's been locked up as KT Smurf wants to take down the Zac. Now it's Caitlyn that gets a kill on the Jarvan, and UBC says, you've been caught. And you can definitely tell how important this Baron was as the fight for it lasted an incredible amount of time. Talkplay love there, recognizing that he has to get this Baron. He flashed to try to get the steal. Unfortunately, it just was not enough. UBC will walk away with this Baron, and what will most likely be the beginning of the end for SFU. Oh, now with the Baron buff on them, they are pushing down multiple lanes. The top lane tier 2 does wind up falling. The middle lane tier 2 is being pressured by that Olaf. The Maokai teleport tank onto the minion means that this neck uh, inhibitor tower is going to wind up falling, as will the top inhibitor. Now Zach is respawned. Jarvan is on the respawn, but still has half the amount of time on his ultimate left to cool down. Multiple, multiple map objectives, multiple turrets taken by UBC, all off the back of that one. Fight. An 8k lead and even more to take. A tier 2 mid lane that is about a couple of hits away. 248 HP missing. And then you have a f Infernal Dragon to top things off. I mean to insult to injury at this point. Making sure that they get this dragon. And they should be poised to really close this one out with this massive swing of gold that just stemmed from nothing more than an indecisive call from SFU in recognizing whether to turn or stay onto the Baron. Yeah, it looked like they might have been able to get the Baron the first time around, but the second time, the Aurelian Soul Zone damage just got Nomadic down so extremely low. Jin, not known as the fastest Baron taker, although Cassiopeia does have a lot of damage under kit to do that. But now, with the Baron down, Infernal Dragon has been the target that the sights have been set on here. Zach tries to go over the wall. The Blast Blade is just going to slingshot himself out of that one. But now he might wind up being caught by the dueling coming out here from UBC. Jana does get hit with the Mantra Empowered Q from Karma, so he's going to be dissuaded. But that's the second Infernal Drake now for UBC. I think only Infernal Drakes have spawned this game. Lucky them. But I think that we also have to touch on UBC's approach towards the Baron, which was, while well, the mistake was on SFU, UBC capitalized it very well. They knew that they could not contest the Baron in a straight-on fight, so they merely sent out the tanks in front. They met. They only played Aurelian Soul with the orbs to make sure that everybody was being damaged, and they really just skirted back and utilized the Baron as a source of damage. Karma was about a 20% before the fight had even begun. 
and then they utilized that as well to just try to deal as much DPS as possible to the members. So they played it very well, skirting around the outside, and they got the Baron as a response. And now if they try this approach of a 1-4 and the inhibs into the, the top side, they should be able to break the base relatively easily. Well, when Travis talked to Bobkin in the interviews after game number three, Bobkin said that UBC was going to have to capitalize on SFU's mistakes to come out the victors in this series. And that Baron play was one big mistake from SFU. So that is a capitalization that UBC has been able to transition into now an eight and a half thousand gold lead seven towers to one and picking up that second infernal drake now this is the the play that they were going for last game as well or two games ago actually in game number three baron buff acquired taking it slow keeping those cannon minions alive to keep consistent damage down on that tower it's a pretty sick power play especially because you have the kaylin just hitting pot shots into the turret it will surely go down in the next wave or two and what that's going to let them do is that's going to let them funnel into the mid lane and really get past the choke because once they get past the choke the formation that the entire team can take can change shape completely. It's a lot harder to go in. And Cassiopeia, it's a four-man engagement. This is actually very good engagement. Cassiopeia just doesn't have the help to survive as she winds up going down. That's going to be the tower in the mid lane going in favor of UBC as well. Zach has picked up the Caitlyn as a kill, though, so there's not a lot more damage onto the inhibitors coming out from this UBC team. She has a large majority of their damage, but Aurelian Soul, the other damage threat, is just dragging it around in the back lines here. They're trying to get onto the Matic. He is going to wind up flashing away, barely stays alive. You some clutch karma shields with a flash forward from CJ will pick up a kill onto Zach. There's a flash forward from KT oh, Smurf as well. He picks up a kill onto Jin. Olaf is barely going to stay alive. He tries to life steal off of some minions, but a shutdown comes through onto Aurelian Soul. Now Karma being chased up by the Janna, which is something oh. I don't think I've ever seen before. But Kaza, the flag and drag coming out. The undertow goes through. The slow uh -huh. is there, but one last dragon lance means that Gold Jet will pick up that kill. Now CJ tried to do his darndest as a Maokai to take down this inhibitor. Janna actually joining back into the fight is 734. They're trying to get the inhibitor, but Cassio has respawned because this fight has gone on it's that the long. It's the list battle, and the Jarvan will continue to chase Janna, even though she still has flashlights. It's nothing more than the tease. You're going the wrong way. No, well, he's actually going to chase over the wall, but does dissuade himself. Now, CJ, though, he is without any summoners besides a teleport, which will not help him God, out in this fight. this takes place. forever. It does take a long time. The poison slowly trickling down. The twisted advance forward. He is going to get rooted up there by the Karma Tether. Does get the sap magic off one last time, but a shutdown goes to Demnus. That's the cap power, if I've seen it. And that engage, at least it netted the mid lane turret for UBC. They were able to take that turret down, but it is unfortunate that they didn't recognize that they were taking it without the fight happening. The fight was so elongated that the everybody just got completely lost off track in sense of focusing on the objective. So for this next fight, it will be a lot easier for them to deal with keeping themselves in check because the carries from all sides except Kaylin don't have flash so it's a lot easier to say all right if you're not in position you will stay out of position if you're in a great position then we have to accord play accordingly make sure that our tanks are providing the proper zone and that Janna is doing nothing more but disengaging because that last engage you know Janna has been delegated to just stopping Jarvan and Zack but nobody's really in charge of keeping Cassiopeia from flash ulting and you really can't prevent that Mm -hmm. And the only thing that has been really stopping SFU so far has been Demnis' usage of the ultimate, but that last fight, he did get a fairly solid one off, although he was the, rece the recipient of the frontline damage from that point. As soon as it was used, they collapsed on him, and he was evaporated from that fight. But 6-3-3 three, and three on this Cassiopeia, much improved from his last performance in game number three, where I believe he was 1-6-3. So the Cassiopeia performance is definitely better here, but it is going to be something they have to rely on. The Jin build with the Essence Reaver has gone for the Rapid Fire Cannon, now building up, has the Last Whisper going for Lord Dominic, needs to just be able to pierce through some of this armor. He's still a decent ways away from really ripping through any members of UBC. And I'm glad you brought that up, the reliance onto this Cassiopeia. Now she's most likely going to be reliably dead Ooh. because she's getting picked off from the mid lane. Oh, but they oh turn around God. on the 735. He gets she's picked alive. up and Cassiopeia's alive. The Saracen Brace Shield coming out in addition to the Karma Shield just keeping her alive. CJ's trying to dive into the back line, but the kiting coming out from Demnis. He's going to stay alive. The GA goes down, and SFU 
flock around like a group of vultures and pick up oh another my God, kill. What a glorious bait from them is what looked like to be a Cassiopeia looking for a boot, just completely out of position. Immediately they pounce onto 735. He doesn't even see it coming. He has flash, he's got heal, he just dies right away. And now SFU is poised to what seems to be a Baron out of all things as their top laner and AD carry are down for UBC. They gotta be careful. This Baron was the thing that baited them into the poor decision to fight last time around, and UBC has a little bit more members on the map than they did last time. The Aurelian Soul is still there. The Zac engage will get dissuaded by the Janna, but they're able oh, to there's... catch up on the Kaza here. Oh, the Karma Tether goes down. The Ragnarok is not available for a couple more seconds. The Janna Monsoon has been used to disengage. The Deadly Flourish roots up this Olaf. They really want to bring down that jungler, and Demnis will be on a killing spree to do so. Ace in the hole comes out as 735 has revived, so while they chase down that Olaf, the other members of UBC have been able to respawn, and the Teleport coming in. Looks like CJ wants to start this fight. He teleported into the mid lane, throws out the sapling. They were waiting. We're there. getting frisky because now there is Cataclysm available and immediately onto the Caitlyn. Zach has a flash to get in. Oh, Caitlyn winds up getting bounced around by the Zach here. The oh, curtain yeah. call comes out. Caitlyn's kind of all by herself here. The Cassiopeia's coming from one side, the Zach from the other. The trap went down though. The paralyzing gaze not in time. Caitlyn picks up a kill, but Aurelian Soul with zone in the back line. Goes down to Jin. Now a double kill picked up for 735 as he runs forward and picks up that Jin. Top play love is as small as I've ever seen a Zach get. Is he oh! no? He fails to jump over the wall, but he still has the cell division passive. But all that's gonna do is buy him a one-way ticket to the Grave is 735, picks up his third kill. And UBC is just pushing down the inhibitors like it, nothing has happened before. We're just doing a little fast forward here, and now they're going to be able to push down for what appears to be the game. 18 seconds onto the carries. They might be looking at double inhibits or Nexus turrets at least. Yeah, JJL seems to be the only person alive. We still only have a couple seconds. Now Driven is available. Cassiopeia and Jin under 10 seconds. So UBC net themselves one Nexus tower and a double inhibitor for their troubles there. Another questionable fight around the Baron pit for the side of SFU cost them dearly. And it's just overstaying for SFU. What is a very good idea turns into an idea that stems from the result of a previous one. And when you've exhausted your resources, your HP, your cooldowns, just so much to try to take down the Olaf, which took a lot of time, you are just not capable to taking a fight when you now have to deal with a new raid boss of Maokai. And the best part about that for UBC was Kaza didn't have his Ragnarok never had to burn it, eventually winds up going down, but now is available with the Ragnarok, with the Ghost, and now they also have their Smite up, so they don't, they're don't. they not able to go for this Baron. Their Super Minions now barreling down two separate waves and only one Nexus Tower left alive, so for SFU, this is really going to be about turret defense for a while. And the unfortunate part in their defense is that, as you mentioned long ago, they rely on Cassiopeia. There is not enough damage without Cassiopeia. So if she's the one looking for these engages and dying immediately, there is just nobody there to clean things up. Because when you look at Jin, he is over 100 CS down. That is level 14 to 16. He does not have Infinity Edge yet completed. He's basically a purely utility, utility build right now. And so when he's put in a position where he has to finish the Maokai, the Olaf, the Janna, he's just not capable to deliver. And now a Baron's being taken by UBC. UBC are able to get the Baron as CJ's Maokai just zones on the front line. Curtain Call has already been done, and that's a lot of damage. Aurelian Soul from the back. Mentioned. Bulljet is being locked up in the front line. Aurelian Soul gets a massive stun on everybody. The Paralyzing Games comes out for Cassiopeia, but she just absolutely melts. That's a third kill picked up now as Zach White up falling, Nematic twirling his gun, trying to get out of that, but the Aurelian Soul comes in, picks himself up a double kill. Goljet is the only member of SFU left alive. His low health bar, his low damage, he is not going to be able to save this push. And UBC with five members strong, looking for the ace. Not oh. gonna quite get it, but they are gonna be looking for that last Nexus tower and the last Nexus of the best of five. The last member goes down, the fifth and final Nexus, and the complete reverse sweep goes to you. Looks like they were just teasing us the entire time. Those two casted in games really seem to have meant nothing because